Hello everyone, it's Wednesday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyang. Today, November 22nd, is Kimchi Day, the day not only aims to raise awareness of the traditional Korean side dish, but also to sustain the tradition of making it, the process known as Kimjang. Other countries and U.S. states are recognizing Kimchi Day as well, and soon the U.S. House of Representatives is expected to pass a resolution designating November 22nd as Kimchi Day as well. But not just kimchi, other Korean foods and products such as kimbap and kim are being recognized, backed by the global popularity of K-pop, K-movies and K-dramas. What is unique about Korean food that makes it enjoyable? And what support could the government give to maintain K-food's global recognition? For this, we invite Judy Jeu, a chef and restaurateur who is also the founder and owner of the Korean restaurant chain Seoul Bird. Judy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And we also have Jean-Pierre Gabriel, an author and food consultant. Good to have you with us, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Now, first question to our Gabriel. Now, before we talk about specific products and food enjoying popularity, how does the gastronomic experience affect one's view of a country's culture? Yes, there is two things. First, gastronomy. Gastronomy, you are, we are speaking about uh, high-level uh, restaurants and so on. And it's a matter of fact that the last years and the past year, what happened in Seoul with the, um, all the chefs uh, who are now Michelin star is very important. And it's not only in, uh, in Seoul. We'll see that after. But more important, you know, in countries with a long culinary tradition, Cuisine is still one of the primary concerns today. And just an example, sociologists and uh, ethnologists who study migrants and uh, refugees will tell you that the food is the second treasure they want to preserve right after the language. So food and more than gastronomy is really important. Right, I see. So gastronomic experience and cuisine indeed can have a great impact on how one sees a country's culture. Interesting. Now, uh, Judy, uh, exports of kimchi, the traditional Korean pickled vegetables, have continued to increase by more than 10% on year thanks to rising demand from the U.S. and Europe. What could be the reason behind such popularity? I think it's a few different things. Number one, it's definitely awareness and the rise of K-pop, Korean dramas, even K-beauty has just made Korean culture come to the forefront in general. And with all of that, many, many people are watching Korean dramas and saying, what are they eating? What are they drinking? Looking at BTS and saying, what are they eating? What are they drinking? I want to do that too. Mm -hmm. But I also think that um, ultimately it has to do all about taste. And the fact that kimchi is so incredibly delicious and it works well with so many different foods is the number one driving factor after awareness. Um, and also... I think it's so versatile. Like people aren't necessarily eating kimchi jjigae, like kimchi stews or soups. They are putting it on top of pizza, putting it on top of burgers, they're putting it on top of almost anything, even Western foods, which is making it a very popular condiment that people are using in their own ways. Right. So awareness and taste itself is making kimchi become very more popular globally. Now, uh, Gabrielle, uh, that being said, South Korea designated November 22nd as Kimchi Day in 2020. And since then, Washington, D.C., California, and New York, as well as countries such as Brazil and Argentina, have publicly introduced Kimchi Day. And now on December 6th, the lower chamber of U.S. Congress is to pass a resolution to celebrate Kimchi Day on the 22nd. What significance does introducing kimchi day yeah. in other countries first, have? First of all, that's really impressive, mm -hmm. you know, that um, that in the U.S. you have such. But, you know, first of all, you, you need the fact that you mention U.S. is important. Uh, everyone knows Koreaton in L.A. Uh, much has been said about this incredible amount of uh, Korean restaurant uh, uh, awards by a Michelin star or two Michelin stars in New York. So and more than Japanese ones. But you know, U.S. and Asian countries are a, a separate world for us. Uh, if I put myself in where I am, I mean Europe and Brussels, the capital of Europe, you know, the Korean culinary culture is still, let us say, unknown. Mm. Of course, of course, kimchi is important. When you speak about Korea to somebody, ah, oh, kimchi, kimchi. But what they know about kimchi, like bechu, of course, but they don't know anything of the spicy bechu. They don't know anything else. 
And in my opinion, uh, kimchi is fantastic. It's healthy. It's really something so great. But it's also the tree wide the forest. There are so many other things important and important for the global culinary world in the in the Korean food culture. Mm. Right, I can. I will tell after what I think because that some examples you will see after. But uh, mm. yeah. right, right, I totally agree. Now, uh, Judy, uh, not just kimchi, uh, other Korean products are also enjoying popularity, and among them are instant noodles, ramen, and seaweed-wrapped rice rolls, which is kimbap. Could you tell us about the craze? I mean, how popular are both of the foods? These foods are extremely popular, and whenever you go into Korean grocery stores, particularly in the U.S. or the United Kingdom, it's right there, front and center. Lines and aisles of instant ramen noodle cups, and in the in the refrigerated case, you see many, many different varieties of kimbap. And I think that this is um, something that is very familiar to people, also, and to Westerners. You know, Westerners, we've always had, uh, you know, like cup of noodles. Maybe it was just chicken flavored. Um, they've always have been familiar with Japanese sushi. And so this is something that is familiar already, but kind of, you know, tastes a bit different, is more interesting, but spicier. So I think it was a very easy step for many Westerners to go into the Korean instant noodles from eating, you know, kind of maybe boring chicken flavored or beef flavored um, cup of noodles their, their entire lives. And then kimbap, you know, is something that is another easy step from sushi and sometimes even easier because most of the ingredients are cooked. Many people don't want to eat, you know, uh, raw fish. And so kimbap is something that is familiar. Maybe they don't know it by name, but it's something that is welcoming and inviting and easy for them to try and to eat and very, very, you know, obviously fast and food on the go as well. Right, I see. Well, Judy, that makes me wonder. You already mentioned that they already had, you know, familiar foods like this, and uh, I, that makes me wonder what kind of characteristic of Korean, you know, noodles and kimbap do you believe made it stand out? Um, I think it's the flavor again. Mm. I mean, at the end of the day, it has to do with the product. It's all about taste. And Korean flavors are so incredibly bright and vibrant and in your face and punchy and memorable. And so people love those deep umami flavors that you get from all of the tradition of fermentation you know, from the kimchi to the gochujang to the tenjang. And so I think it's ultimately all about that wow factor and the fireworks going off in your mouth that makes it so incredibly popular. All right, I see. Flavor indeed. Now, uh, Gabrielle, yes. <laughs> there must be many other reasons why Korean food is so popular. And some say one reason is that such products can easily constitute a meal or just serve as a snack. Do you agree that the convenience of these foods has helped Korean food to be popular? Yes, yes, totally. And, and in a way, I come back to what I already said. You know, I find really a pity, and still in Europe, not in the US, and not in some Asian country like Thailand, for instance, like Bangkok, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we still are stuck on, stick story, on kimchi, in a way, bibimbap, and no fried chicken, what we have uh, as shime in, uh, in Korea. But who knows Sapchi? Who knows Yukwe? In my opinion, Yukwe is the best beef tartar in the world. And you don't see that in, in our countries, you know? Also, an, another point very important. You know, the world is, in a way, and the young people, not only, uh, of course, for really powerful taste and a really bright uh, uh, taste, but, you know, Vegan is something really uh, important now, and more and more among the young people. Who knows the Korean food temple? Of course, we had chef tables with John Kwan, Monk, but who knows about this cuisine who can also bring a lot, a lot, a lot to the world, uh, you know, food experience. That's for, you, for me, it's a, also a very important point. So things have been done, fantastic thing, I will, tell again and again, because I admire what Korea is doing about the globalization of the food culture, but there is a lot to do again. Right, I can now agree more that there needs to be more to be done uh, for the Korean food industry to develop more. Now, uh, Judy, not just convenience foods like kimbap and tteokbokki uh, that we have talked about, South Korea's fisheries and agricultural products such as kim or dried seaweed are also seeing an increase in demand. What is unique about them and could they become, you know, even more globally recognized? 
Yes, you're seeing roasted seaweed snacks mm -hmm. pop up absolutely everywhere from um, Arira, um, oh, did I lose you? Okay, and anyway, from, um, you know, uh, you, the United States to the UK, you know, you're seeing them labeled in, um, only as roasted seaweed snacks, so, which is a little bit disappointing because at Trader Joe's, there's no recognition to where it came from. It doesn't say Korean roasted seaweed mm. snacks. And actually one of my friends there said, oh, you got to try this new thing. It's amazing. It's a Trader Joe's product. I'm like, no, it's not. This is a traditional Korean food product. And you're seeing it pop up in the UK also. You know, they're even big, you know, quick serve chains like Itsu, which is a Japanese brand that are serving seaweed roasted snacks and doesn't really say that it's Korean. So mm. I'm very happy that these products are becoming extremely, extremely popular. But I would love to see there to be a nod to the Korean tradition. Um, again, it has to do all about flavor and the fact that it's so incredibly healthy. I think that, you know, seaweed is full of umami. It's the source of umami. It has that nice saltiness, the crispiness, so it really is quite satiating. Um, and it's also very, very good for you, full of vitamins, full of minerals. And so it's a very nice kind of um, easy snack to have on the go. And, you know, it's it's good with rice. It's good to put on top of anything. But what I'm not seeing, which I'm disappointed in, is that nod that it is part of Korea and it is a Korean product. Mm, right. So more efforts should be put so that uh, more people could know and recognize that all those products that are being popular are actually Korean food, right? Exactly. Yes, of course. Right, yeah, right. That is very important. You, mm -hmm. you mentioned gim, you know, and we mm -hmm. have seen the image of the roasted gim. I, every time I'm going to Seoul, I bring uh, 10 or 20 packs of this. And um, I let, you know, in some supermarkets in Belgium, they are selling this, the same thing, but also n not telling that it's Korean. Mm. There is another, we can also talk about that. I was always surprised because when I tried to speak about gim or tashima, people say, oh, nori, kombu. I, I think it's a long way to go. Mm. But knowing the Korean names of the product would be very, or very also important and interesting just to place. Everybody speaks about you, Yuzu. Who speaks about Yuja? And we know how much uh, Yuja Korea produce. You know, mm. so that that's um, that's one point about what you uh, you said. Um, uh, what I what uh, um, I still play, place myself in the European context and Brussels, capital of Europe. Again, um, you know, not to be disappointed. There are only two interesting and good mm. uh, Korean restaurant in Brussels, no more. The last one is run by Songu de Jam, you must know. It was a two Michelin star uh, restaurant. He's born in Korea and he rediscovered the roots of his ancestor. And that's fantastic. But it would be for me a dream if I could bring my, uh, my kids and my grandchildren to, you know, uh, sort of easygoing uh, Korean restaurant mm -hmm. where you can have a bibimbap, uh, chapche, or even a nice small bansang just to enter in the in the Korean food culture. And that we don't have. And we have seen image of supermarkets. In Brussels, there is only one small supermarket. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult, even when you go there to find, you know, um, uh, 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 potato starch noodles or, or, or things like that. So there is still, still, still a lot to do and also to, to, to promote the other product, you know, like the dried right. anchovy to make stock, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right, I see, Gabrielle. Thank you for your view. You. Now, uh, Judy, uh, interest in one area can, you know, encourage people to become interested in other areas as well. Um, is Korean food playing a role in making foodies from around the world become more interested in other aspects of Korean culture, such as, you know, K-drama, K-pop, and K-beauty right now? I think it's actually more the reverse, mm -hmm. <laughs> you oh. know. Obviously, you know, K-pop and K-drama is really driving the interest in Korean food, mm. but um, I think that that's absolutely fine. You know, it's it's interesting because, you know, in just in my lifetime, I've gone from being embarrassed about my lunchbox growing up, being the only Korean and nobody knowing what Korean food was or what it looked like or anything, to now, um, you know, later on in my life where there's this 
complete phenomenon that's going around and people can't get enough of Korean culture. And it's, um, you know, K-pop and Korean dramas have created almost this cultural voyeurism, mm -hmm. you know, where everybody is so incredibly interested in it. And, um, and I think it's great because it's created a, an entryway into the culture, you know, through these different lenses. And food is often part of that entryway and one of the first points of entry to really learning about a culture and experience it through taste. And right. you know, food tells a history of, of a country, mm -hmm. tells a history of like feast, famine, colonization, war, recession, everything. So it is, um, it is a way to really learn about mm. a country. Right, I see. Well, you know, enjoying popularity right now is of course very important, but uh, in my opinion, maintaining such popularity is much more important. So uh, Gabrielle, let's take a look at what the government can do to make K-food more recognized. Some experts underline the importance of institutions for nurturing talent to develop Korean cuisine even more. What are your thoughts? You know, first of all, uh, I admire really what Korea has done on a government level until now uh, to promote uh, the Korean food. I think no one country has mobilized as much effort than Korea. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, there are many actions taken by uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, also the embassies who support, for instance, masterclass uh, with John Kwan. There was recently uh, a few one in Europe. But I think in a way you see this, that these actions are not always coordinated. One is doing that, the other one is doing that. And you don't feel, uh, you know, the power of what has been invested. And I think um, Korea needs to, I would advise, if I can, you know, as sort of multi-year uh, national plan, you know, to, to, to promote the globalization of um, uh, Korean cuisine. Um, at the level of gastronomy with Top Chef, and the level most, more, more, to make this ingredient available all the Korean ingredients more available. And I don't speak about the US and about, and about uh, Asia. I speak about Europe. Right. So you see, you mean that you mean the government needs to show more of a coordinated support, right? Absolutely. Mm, Absolutely. Right. right. I see. Well, uh, Judy, some popular products or dishes face being imitated or even having their origin disputed as well. And of course, one example is kimchi, as seen in the dispute that resulted from China's claim that the original is pao chai. Uh, in what ways should the government prepare itself to deal with such controversy, given that more and more food would potentially become recognized? I think that's always going to happen, actually. Mm. You know, anytime there is success, um, everyone's going to want to have a piece of it and kind of be credited um, on, on their own. So I think the government really just has to have the facts. They have to have the history and the tradition in place and, and just really nail it down that, you know, this is where it comes from. This is why this is, you know, this is this is the history and this is why it's so part of Korean culture. You know? And there's always going to be debates about this. You know, you see this around diff different things um, all across the world. You know, where was fried chicken invented? Where was, you know, pie invented? All, mm -hmm. all of these things, you know. And it has to do with the world being so incredibly global and trade and, you know, ideas. And so, you know, literally today's invention is tomorrow's tradition. So it's a very gray area. You know, Korean fried chicken has become uniquely Korean. It is not necessarily something that was invented in Korea, but now it's become a uniquely Korean product. Mm. But its origins are actually from the United States or maybe even Scotland with fried chicken. You know, who knows? It's 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 such a debate. So um, I think that, you know, there's some things that are uniquely Korean, but we always have to be sensitive and um, understand that the world is a global place and there are influences coming from all over the world, from different peoples and different cultures. And this has been going on for centuries. All right. I see your point. Now, I believe this mm -hmm. will be our last question, but I'd like to ask both of our experts. Now, in order to develop the industry even more, what can be done? Gabriel, could you start us off? Yes, very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, in 91, long time ago, I was invited in Piemonte for the inauguration of the ICHIF, Italian Culinary Institute for Foreigners. This institute was dedicated to, to teach to chef the Italian cuisine. And there were a lot of Japanese because at this time there were 6,000 uh, Italian restaurants in Japan. Why not 
to establish in Seoul, mm. uh, you know, a Korean inter international culinary academy for foreign chefs mm. and teach them all the, the all the Korean, not all, the most important step of the Korean cuisine, not only for the recipes, but also, as says Judy, for the ingredients who are fabulous. Right. I, I think it's a totally great idea to have a Korean International Culinary Academy in Seoul. Thank you, uh, Gabrielle, for your opinion. And uh, Judy, may I ask your opinion as well? Yes, I think that um, I think the the Korean government also needs to perhaps use the you know ten to fifteen million of us uh, Koreans that were brought that were born abroad our, our gyopos a bit more as as ambassadors you know because we we are literally bicultural and growing up in different places and we are the best ambassadors to translate our culture to wherever we are living you know um even like little things like kimchi on top of hamburgers you know this is how an ingredient goes truly global where people just take one ingredient and then they use it in a way that is unexpected but I think that that is a success. For instance, last night we cooked a 10 Downing Street, my team and I. And, you know, we were asked to do traditional British canapes, which is a little twist of Korean ingredient. Mm. And so we, one of the things was pigs in the blankets, and we served it with samjang, and it tasted fantastic. So maybe that ends up being something that people do at home during their Christmas dinner is, you know, in the blanket with, with samjang. We also did, you know, a bulgogi beef with a truffle, you know, soy sauce, um, uh, mayonnaise and, and, and dressing, you know. So these, these little twists that bring Korean ingredients to a different culture, I think that is very, very easy and it makes the food much more accessible. And it's those little successes, I think, that can really help Korean food go global when other ethnic cuisines and, and people start just bringing little ingredients into their own food here and there. And it becomes just like grabbing, you know, paprika or cayenne or pepperoncinos or something else in the fridge, just another hot sauce. And it happens to be go, go, gochujang, but they're maybe putting it on lasagna or spaghetti. All right, I see. Well, I, I guess the bottom line of this is to make Korean food more accessible. All right. Well, thank you, Judy, for your point of view. Hopefully, we can continue to, develop, uh, to see the development of Korean food industry and its global popularity. Well, uh, that's all the time we have for today's edition. Uh, thank you, Gabrielle and Judy, for thank your you. time and insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you. That's all for Within the Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.